I'm Batman. I am Batman! These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, Vinfuso. And by now, at this stage in our platonic virtual friendship, I think you'd know enough about me to know that I'm a bit of a Batman fan, to put it mildly. And when most people of my generation, or a little bit before my generation, think of Batman, they typically think of the Tim Burton series. And it's not hard to see why. Tim Burton's Batman revitalized the character. Sure, there were comic books out at the time that really retold the tale of the Dark Knight and made him... you know, actually dark. But not everyone picks up a comic book. And at the time, the public knowledge of Batman was basically that he was a billionaire in bat ears who liked to drink a tall glass of OJ and dance. Yeah, that was the Caped Crusader. And then Tim Burton comes along and delivers this version of the Batman mythos that looks closer to a Cure music video than anything we've seen Batman related before. This version of the Defender of Gotham was iconic. So iconic, in fact, that over two decades since the Tim Burton movies came out, they're being given a proper follow-up sequel in a brand new comic book series appropriately titled Batman 89. A comic book sequel that I personally am really excited for. But this got me thinking, which I, I don't do often. This got me thinking about all the other Batman media that tried to reference or more accurately tried to attach itself to this franchise. Yeah, believe it or not, there have been a couple different movies and even TV shows that desperately tried to subtly stand behind Tim Burton's series and say, oh, oh yeah, we're, we're with that. First and foremost, the most obvious of which being Batman Forever and Batman and Robin, which were supposed to be the next two movies in that franchise. After Batman Returns proved to be a little bit too gothic for a younger audience, leaving them with nightmares and leaving the studio with an overabundance of never-sold McDonald's toys, Warner Brothers decided to go in a different direction, inviting Joel Schumacher to come in and take the helm. Now, Joel would be a great fit for this franchise, had he been making something a little bit closer to his days in Lost Boys. Instead, he was brought in to completely retool the image of the world's greatest detective, dialing it back on the darker themes and elements from the previous movies, and upping the camp factor significantly. Despite most of the original cast not returning to the project, and Gotham feeling like an entirely different place than the Gotham shown before in the last two movies, the tone being complete polar opposites and the film just overall not feeling like a follow-up but a brand new beginning, Oh, and that's not to mention that Two-Face, in this version of events, somehow has three separate faces. I'm sorry, listen, I, I love Tommy Lee Jones, but he looks nothing like Lando Calrissian. My suspension of disbelief only suspends so far. I, how, how are these the same person? How am I supposed to think that? These movies were in fact supposed to be the next chapters in the book Tim Burton wrote. Hence the returning Alfred and Commissioner Gordon. The only two actors from those movies to come back for these ones. There's also a cheeky reference here and there to what came before, but nothing really concrete. You like strong women. I've done my homework. Or do I need skin tight vinyl and a whip? Personally, I'm kind of glad that the comics are going to act like these two films never happened. And that's coming from someone who actually really enjoys Batman Forever. They just don't work as a new installment and are probably better viewed with a clean slate and an acknowledgement of this just being its own thing. Now I previously said that Michael Keaton as Batman was iconic, and it was, but I think there's definitely at least one more person who people think about when they think of Batman. A man who may or may not be in the outro of all my videos. I'm talking of course about Kevin Conroy. The animated series gave us performances, character arcs, and storylines that have stayed with Batman fans for years to come. The show even helped shape the overall depiction of Gotham's protector. The series was monumental and its legacy is legendary. But such a series wouldn't exist without Tim Burton's influence. To say that this took inspiration from the first two Batman movies would be a bit of an understatement, as the show itself seemed to lightly imply that it may or may not be tied into said series. The show had a similar tone to the movies and even used some of the same music cues, with its actual theme song sounding ripped directly out of Batman Returns. And speaking of ripped straight out of Batman Returns, was the show's depiction of the Penguin. Now, up until this point in time, the Penguin was nothing more than a wealthy aristocrat and a thief. Your standard frumpy, uh, big-bellied short man in a suit, which I can mostly relate to except I don't wear suits. Whereas the Burt movies depicted him as a pointy-nosed, three-fingered Penguin Man who lived in the sewers of Gotham City and rode a big yellow duck boat. And, oh hey, look, it's... it's the exact same thing. Again, that has never been a thing before the Tim Burton Batman movies. 
And actually, from my understanding, this was mandatory. Those in charge of creative actually wanted to present the Penguin as was, but they were instructed to make him look closer to the Danny DeVito version of the character. Granted, the animated series did make the character significantly more sophisticated than the very thing of nightmares. Seriously, a, a bleeding Frank Reynolds is gonna haunt me for the rest of my life. Frank Reynolds is bleeding all over the place. Do I look suspicious? But seriously, at the end of the day, we all knew which penguin this penguin was trying to be. Outside of that, in one episode when Batman is locked up, a doctor in Arkham specifically refers to the Joker as Jack Napier, as if that's his real name. Jack Napier, Harvey Dent, Pamela Isley, or as you call them, the Joker, Two-Face, and Poison Ivy. The origin name that he was given in Batman 1989. Not to mention that the Joker's origin story in the animated series is that Batman had let him fall into a vat of chemicals, which again is taken directly from the Batman 1989 movie. I mean, I know that this was canon in the comics from time to time, but not always. And also, the comics never presented him as a gangster in his past life before being the Joker. And yet the Burton film and the animated series did. It seems like the animated series, for a time being at least, attempted to loosely tie itself in with the successful Tim Burton movies. Whether it be the people on the creative end of things or the people on the end of the business end of things, for one reason or another, it was kind of seen as a spiritual sequel. Until it grew enough to become its own thing and then kickstarted a whole universe, which is what happened. But it doesn't stop there. I, I wish it did. But it doesn't. As the travesty that was the Catwoman movie so desperately wanted to try and act as a spin-off to everyone's favorite Batman movie, Batman Returns. So much so that the making of this Catwoman, who was not Selina Kyle, in fact, but was someone named Patience Phillips, their origin story was nearly identical. How Patience becomes Catwoman is almost a shot-for-shot -shot remake of how Michelle Pfeiffer became Catwoman. This time with more CGI cats, because, you know, can't go wrong with CGI cats, can you? Now, mind you, this was never the origin story of Catwoman before Tim Burton's movies. Catwoman was never some woman chosen by ancient cats to give her nine lives and cat-like abilities. She was just your standard garden variety cat burglar. Pun intended. This movie gives the secondary Catwoman, a woman who did not exist before this movie, the same exact origin story as Selina Kyle from the second Batman movie. Again, almost shot for shot. If that wasn't enough, the movie even drops an Easter egg of the first Catwoman when Patience is looking through photos of Catwoman who came before her. They so badly wanted to low-key call this canon, but unlike those cats, no one was biting. You know, I don't know what it is that made fans want to separate this from one of the greatest Batman movies of all time. But, but somewhere between the horrible BDSM cat suit and Halle Berry literally rubbing catnip on her face, fans of the source material just... just didn't get behind it. All of this makes sense, though. Well, no, no, uh, Halle Berry rubbing catnip on her face does not make... it will never make sense. I, I am not okay. I'm uncomfortable, still. This happened in 2004. I'm still uncomfortable. But the origin story being told here makes sense, as the script was a revised and reworked version of a solo Catwoman spinoff from the Batman Returns movie that wound up getting lost in developmental hell. And that also makes sense, because the movie's final product, Axis Hell on Earth. You know, I, I want to say more on this, but I think there's a Star Wars line that perfectly emulates how I feel about it. It's time to let old things die. Last but not least, well, may maybe, maybe least to some people, because... People really typically aren't a fan of what I'm about to bring up. But last but not least was the little-known show titled Birds of Prey. A show that lasted for all of 13 episodes and made an impact with no one but me. More on that show in the near future. When this show was about to air, the WB promoted it by using scenes from Batman Returns. Namely the Batman and Catwoman scenes. Kind of implying that this show was spun off from it. Legend tells of a love between the Cape Crusader and a beautiful adversary. But Batman and Catwoman left behind something extraordinary. The child of two legends. And when the show actually aired, it didn't reuse the Batman Returns footage, but instead it just basically recreated it? They literally used the Batman suit from the Tim Burton Batman movies, and the Catwoman suit was entirely the same design, but now with the added benefit of her hair coming out of the back of her mask. 
I think it's also fair to mention that you can make a clear comparison between Ian Abercrombie and Michael Gow's interpretation of Alfred, and how it's nearly the same exact performance. I mean, it's great, but it's very much the same kind of energy there. Typically, Alfred's much more sarcastic, and while he's always there for Bruce, he's always present, also present is his dry wit and sense of humor. Miss Gordon, I heard that you've discovered our little secret. Yes, I admit it. I am Batman. But these Alfreds are much more wholesome and all-knowing. And sure, maybe you could say that this is a bit of a stretch. I don't think it is, but I can understand where you're coming from. This is practically the same performance from two separate actors. Both equally good. It's kind of a shame that Ian didn't get a chance to play the character again. W was into it. I enjoyed it. The show also on occasion heads over to Arkham Asylum. And whenever it does, it always uses the same piece of stock footage from Batman Forever. Every exterior shot of the asylum is met with this... The show also made occasional, albeit brief and vague references to the initial series while it was trying to tell its own stories. So, there you have it. Those were the Tim Burton Batman pseudo spin-offs. Of course, none of them were official, except for maybe Batman Forever and Batman Robin, but even in saying that, none of these felt like a legitimate spin-off. I mean, they all seemed to derive from the Tim Burton Batman movies, but they didn't really seem to properly uh, sequelize it. Is that a word? Probably not. It is now. So it's kind of nice that those movies and everything else is being retconned and written off. I, for one, am really excited about the prospect of an official spinoff now. I'm really excited to see how the characters look, how the characters act. I'm I, I can't wait to see the return of characters that we've seen before, and also the inclusion of new characters. I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that maybe finally uh, Lando Calrissian will in fact become Two-Face and uh, Tommy Lee Jones will be uh, nowhere in sight. I'm wondering how they're going to continue the Batman and Catwoman romance considering she's only on one life now. She can't keep dying because she only has one left. Who knows? May maybe Max Shrek's son uh, rises to power. I, I don't know. A anything could happen at this point in time. Anyway, I look forward to the future and seeing what this series brings. Uh, you can bet your ass at some point I will be talking about it on this channel. With that being said, I'm V Infuso, your least favorite YouTuber, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole... And you too would like to become a V-Generate? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.